Praises to your name. 
Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report. If there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. I want to talk to you tonight just from the thought, I don't think so. And there's a reason why the Lord gave me this thought. Uh, in chapel service today, during the school, when we were here, I began to talk to the children about imaginations. And we talked about that a little bit Sunday, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. Everybody say every thought. To the obedience of Christ. Imaginations, I asked the children, I said, what would you define imaginations as? And I believe Jeremiah said, something that is not real, that you think on. An imagination is something that is fantasized. It is something that is perceived, though it is not real. It is something that we get into our mind, and if we're not careful, we will harp on it until... It becomes a reality even though there's nothing real about it. Imaginations are very powerful. Uh, I, I believe probably while we were all young and growing up, we had our favorite superhero character. We had our favorite athlete. We had, we, we had our favorite movie star. We, we had our favorite singer. And when we would watch them, I'm sure that we found ourselves oftentimes walking imaginarily into their spot and being them. And even considering what we might do if we were in their same situation. Imaginations are things that are not real. But the enemy plants them in our heart as if it is real. And I think that sometimes we think that the devil doesn't have power, he doesn't have authority, and that is such a misnomer in the church. Well, the devil's under my feet. Well, the devil is not under your feet. He's under Christ's feet. Come on, somebody. But he still has power and authority to do things in our life only at the behest of God so that it might produce something worthwhile in us. In fact, when Ananias and Sapphira came to Peter and lied about the cost of the property and what they sold it for, Peter looked at both of them and said, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. Satan can put things in your heart. And he can take things out of your heart. And that's the reason why you must be very diligent about what you allow in your heart. Because the Bible said it is out of the heart that proceeds evil imaginations. Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. The heart is a very sensitive place, and it is a very powerful place. And if we're not careful, the enemy will overcome our heart with vain imaginations, with things that are absolutely unreal that we perceive to be real. And if you, again, if you concentrate enough on that imagination, something that is not even in matter will become real to you. The enemy's objective is to wear you down mentally. So that he can kill you spiritually. The battleground saints of God is in the mind. And the enemy plays mind games. This is psychological warfare. And that's the reason why a lot of us are overcome by the enemy oftentimes. Is because we're looking at the natural. But he's only using the natural to play with us psychologically. He's only using things that we perceive to be ugly and evil in the natural to get into our heart and our spirit so that he can mess with our minds. They are imaginations. And imaginations are powerful. They are overwhelming. And at times they can be overcoming. But at some point we have got to begin to wise up to the devil. In fact, the Bible says that we are to be wise as the serpent, but harmless as a dove. In other words, we have got to be on guard, children of God. The church, especially within the United States, is not very careful about what we put in our hearts. 
We, we allow things into our spirit that God does not want, us, want into our spirit, whether it be things that we watch, things that we listen to, things that we receive in our heart. God does not want those things in our heart. So therefore, when we allow them in there, we open the door for the enemy to create a battlefield. And let me tell you something. When he gets an inch, war is on. And he's not going to stop until you are out of your mind crazy. So you have to be very careful. You have to be careful not to let witchcraft into your mind. Come on, somebody. I, I know some of y'all like Harry Potter, but the fact of the matter is it's witchcraft. And in the word of God, witches were to be taken and stoned and burned. So when I begin to fantasize on things like witchcraft, then all of a sudden I am allowing an evil imagination in my heart. Somebody said, it didn't affect me at all. It didn't bother me at all. It didn't do anything to me at all. Maybe not right now, but you've got some things stored in your spirit that if you're not careful, the enemy's going to walk, walk up on you when you least expect it, and he's going to engage those fields that you are not watching over. He wants to kill you spiritually, so he's going to wear you down mentally. We have so much psychological warfare going on right now. And that's the reason why I encourage you not to ingest too much news. Right. Not to ingest too much information. Because everybody is going to spin things their way in order to draw the crowd that gets them enough sponsorship that they can make their money off of. Right. So be careful what you're allowing into your spirit. Because I'm telling you, the enemy is going to come calling on that battlefield. Right. Come on, somebody. All of a sudden, this person is hating that person and this side of the aisle hating that side of the aisle and nobody trusting anyone anymore and nobody really even having much personal interaction with people because they've been trained through mass media constantly that people are hated and that there's prejudice and bigotry and all of these things that surround people. And as long as you let that in your spirit, you're going to come become one of the most hateful, diabolical people that you know. You're going to be depressed, angry, frustrated constantly. Because if we're not careful, the enemy's going to come call on us. And he's going to create anger and hostility where there should be none because he creates imaginations. He creates things that perceive to be real, but they're not real at all. They're not real at all. I'm telling you, I have to get this in your spirit. There are some things you are obsessing over that is not real. They're imaginations, and as long as you keep them in your spirit, the enemy is winning. Look at somebody tell them the devil is not your friend. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 25 through 26, Paul says this in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. There's a lot of God's people that are being held at the will of the devil. They're being held at the will of Satan. Because they don't want to fill their heads with the Bible. They don't want to fill their heads with worship. They want to fill their heads with worldliness. Listen, I don't care how true it looks. If it is not pure, if it is not lovely, if it is not of a good report, you have no business sitting there thinking on those things. You are destroying yourself psychologically. And now you find yourself in a place where you can't worship, you can't pray, you can't study, you can't do any of these things. Why? Because you have been held captive by the enemy at his will. But I come to tell you tonight, at some point, you're going to have to get some rebellion in your spirit against the devil. Why is it so much easier for God's people to rebel against God than it is his enemy? Why is that so much easier? As if the devil has good plans for your life. God said, I have plans for you. I know the plans that I have for you. And that is to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. But we are more concerned about what's going on in this world. Yeah. Saints of God, listen. My affections are not in this world. I thank God for my life, but I'm not living for it. Come on, somebody. I'm living for another day. 
I'm living for another country. I'm living for another city. And as long as I keep my eyes focused on the hope that is before me, I don't care how much hell breaks out around me. I am going to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this, that my labor is not in vain in the Lord. I'm praying for some of us. Because some of us are easy targets. All it takes is the enemy to flip a switch and all of a sudden we're like lights to a light, uh, flies to a light bulb. Can't get it out of our heads. Can't get it out of our minds. Can't get it out of our spirits. Whether it be, whether it be bad news, whether it be historical narratives, whether it be sexual immoralities. We can't get it out of our heads. It's constantly permeating our minds and our spirits. And that's where we're at because we can't get out of it. You know what? You're being held captive right now. You don't even know it, but you are a POW. You are a prisoner of war. War has broke out and the enemy has got you prisoner. And the only way to get out of it is to acknowledge where you're at. I'm a prisoner of war here. Lord, I've let my mind go places it shouldn't have gone. I've let my heart go into situations it shouldn't have gone. I know better. I knew better. But I continue to go back to this. Why? Because I am a prisoner of war. The enemy has got me. I have fallen into the snare of the devil. And he is holding me captive at his own will. And so he uses whatever tool is available to him. Whatever avenue he can find to disturb your mind. So that he might destroy your destiny. One of the saddest things in the world to me is that God's people have lost their understanding that they actually have a God-given destiny. That God did not create them just for existence. He created them to serve him. He created them. There's something on the inside of you. You don't even know it right now. You don't see it right now. Because honestly, you may not even be looking for it right now. But God has something in, on your life. God has spoken something over you that he wants to see come to fruition. But you're in a place right now where your mind is so muddled and muddy with things that absolutely do not belong to your peace. Come on, somebody. Well, do you know what happened 35 years ago? Yes, I know a lot of things that happened 35 years ago. Can I change them? Absolutely not. What can I do about it? Nothing at all. What can I do right now? Serve the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will be glad and I will rejoice in it. Well, don't you think it's good to know? It's great to know a lot of things, but I am not living there. I am not going to build a home where I have no power to change what has taken place. And some of us, we keep building our home there. We can understand, I got no joy no more. I'm depressed all the time. I'm discouraged all the time. Because you're living there. You are living on the street of despair and you refuse to move. That doesn't make you special. It doesn't make you unique. You're a prisoner of war. And the devil has all kinds of people held captive. In the same chains you are bound. So when we're looking for a, a way to be unique and special, you want to be special, serve God. You want to be unique, serve the Lord. Because the Bible said then you are a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. Come on, somebody, a holy nation. And you have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We live in a generation that cannot handle things psychologically. People are breaking down mentally all over the place because nobody's teaching them how to handle things psychologically. You want to know why? Because Big Pharma keeps pushing their pills. And as long as they could go to somebody and say, I'm depressed, and they get a pill, then Big Pharma keeps making money. But I did not come to put you on a pill. I came to set you free in the name of Jesus. Depression is not a lifetime sentence. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Anxiety is not a lifetime sentence. Somebody said it's a disease. Well, thank God I serve a great physician who can heal to the animal. Well, the Bible said he was wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him, and by his stripes, I am healed. The enemy's after something because he sees what you cannot see. He's just trying to destroy you. And while we're sitting there playing patty cake with the devil and we're 
in the Tennessee waltz with the enemy. He's sitting there distracting us from everything God's called us to do. Because if you ever, ever, ever step up to the call of God in your life, you're going to create havoc for him. And the only way for him to make peace with you is to keep you so distracted you cannot engage the call of God. Ah, come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. The Bible said to be carnally minded is death. Carnal doesn't have to be sexual. Carnal can just be worldly. And so if your mind is continually stayed on worldly things, you are going to have nothing but death and destruction in your path. But to be spiritually minded. Anybody want some peace in here? The Bible said, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You got the Holy Ghost. You got the Spirit of God in you. The Spirit of God does not want to be entangled with this world. The Bible said a good soldier entangleth himself not. Listen, did you hear what that just said? Entangleth himself not with the affairs of this life. He doesn't get wrapped up in worldly events. Right. Y'all remember during the election season, well, every election season, they trump up racism, prejudice, right. bigotry. Right. They just trump it up like crazy. Don't hear nothing about it right now, do you? No. Wait till the election comes. Right. And they're going to divide this nation by color once again. Right. But the place they cannot invade and they will not divide is the church of Jesus Christ. Because we found out a long time ago no matter what color my skin is, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And so when we are inundated with racism, when we're inundated now with disease, we're now divided on who wants the vaccine and who don't want the vaccine. Who wants to wear a mask and who doesn't want to wear a mask. Totally ridiculous argument. Should never be in the church of Jesus Christ. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. And if that is something that you need to do and you've talked to God about it, let it be done. I have no scripture to stop you from these things. Right. And so to argue about it is worldly. It's carnal. Right. But it is equally as carnal to walk around as a terrified person as if somehow the next bug that comes around is going to jump on you and take you out. You either believe that God has the power over life and death or you believe that the devil does. But I'm telling you right now, the Bible said he took the power from him who had power over death and that is the devil. So guess who has power of life and death? Guess who has the keys of death and hell? It is not Lucifer. It is Jesus Christ. trying to destroy. He doesn't want the church to gather. Right. He doesn't want you to love one another. Right. He doesn't want us to preach. He doesn't want us to sing. He doesn't want us to testify. Right. He doesn't want any of this working in the church. He doesn't want it. Because as long as he keeps the church isolated, he keeps us at bay. And as long as he keeps us at bay, he has relative peace to do what he wants to do. Right. But we're having the call to war next week. And people from all over the country and around the world are going to gather in this city next week. And we're going to preach and we're going to worship and we're going to pray over each other. And we're going to have church from Thursday night all the way to Sunday morning. And let me tell you something. I hope and pray that something happens in that conference. That we break up the demon and the devil that has peace right now in this community. And we let him know that the children of God are still alive. The church is still doing well. Jesus Christ is still at the right hand of the Father. And God is still on the throne. trying to destroy you child of God get that in your spirit why do you think he keeps robbing you of your joy he robs you of your worship he robs you of your praise he robs you of your dance he robs you why why do you think you can't do it because you're held captive right now but I come to tell you I come to reveal those chains because there ain't a chain that God can't break there's not a yoke that the anointing can't destroy there is not a tie that binds that the sword of the spirit can't cut asunder psychological it is all in your head whether you like it or not it's all in your head and the only thing that is real is what you believe to be real it doesn't matter if it's not even present physically it can be real you can 
think that people hate you that you've never even talked to. I ain't going to that church. Those people down there don't like me. We don't know you. Never met you before. Praise God. I'm glad. I, I've had people say that. This person said, we're not going down there no more because they say, you know, people down there, they hate them. And I, I don't even know them, honestly. I've never even met them. But what happened is somebody had a grimace on their face or something, and they begin to focus on what somebody, doesn't matter how many people smiled and greeted and praised God, all they focused on was that one person that looked at them with a grimace, have no clue why they looked at them like that, but now they have imagined that people hate them. How can you hate people you don't know? And how can you say people hate you that don't know you? That's what people say, Pastor, you think those people hate you? I said, I don't know how they could. They don't know me. How can you hate somebody you don't know? How can somebody, how, how can you just know that? Some, they don't like me. Neither. How could you know that? But it's a vain imagination that don't, don't, don't even, listen, you've been in department stores and somebody just look your way. Oh, they're talking about me. I'm going to go over there and see what they got to say. I mean, if they're going to look at me, at least come and talk to me about it. When that person may have looked over and thought it was somebody they knew. But now you've allowed this imagination to get into your spirit to the place now. That you think that everybody in Ross is talking about you. Come on, sir. Praise God. What you looking at? They're probably sitting there thinking, what am I looking at? <laughs> it's a vain imagination. It's something in your head. And as long as the enemy can get into your head, as long as he can get into your heart, he's got you. There's some you don't even know the enemy's got it in your heart. He's filled your heart. Say, so how do you know that, Pastor? Because you don't worship no more. Right. You don't praise no more. Right. You don't pray no more. The enemy's got into your heart, and he's holding you captive. Well, what could the enemy do for you but destroy you? Right. The thief cometh not but, but, but to kill, to steal, and destroy. His assignment is to take you out. That's what he wants to do. And so, well, how do you know I'm under attack of the devil? Once you stop worshiping, you're under attack. Right. Once you stop dancing and shouting and praising God and lifting up the name of Jesus, you're under attack. Right. The enemy's got you, and he's holding you captive at his will. Paul deals with this psychological warfare concerning the man who was found sleeping with his father's wife in 1 Corinthians. Paul delivered the man over to Satan. That's what he said. Deliver such a one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. He delivered him over. But the whole purpose of him delivering this man over was for repentance. It wasn't for destruction of the man. It was so that the man would repent. Now this produced the necessary outcome. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, listen, this man is now being overwhelmed. He's now being overcome with much sorrow. The enemy is taking advantage. That's what he said. He said, lest the enemy should get an advantage on us. He said, you bring such a one back in. He said, lest the enemy should take advantage and this man be altogether destroyed. He said, we are not ignorant concerning Satan's devices. In other words, we are not ignorant concerning what the enemy uses. Right. And the enemy uses all kinds of things against us. Yes, sir. He will use your past against you. Right. There is not one person sitting in here that comes from a fluffy background. We all have come from circumstances and situations that if we look back long enough, we will live in regret. Right. And the enemy cannot wait for you to live in regret. Right. He cannot wait for you to exist in the, in the environment of guilt. That's what he wants for you. Doesn't mean that we don't repent. Doesn't mean that we don't ask for forgiveness. But what I cannot do is ask for forgiveness and repent of that thing that I was doing and then have to live the rest of my life with the guilt of it. The Bible said we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
He said, in fact, I take that sin and I cast it far from me as the east is from the west. You say, how far is that, Pastor Jared? Well, if you go east, you'll never, ever encounter west. You just keep going east. So in other words, the Lord said, I have infinitely thrown your sin away from me. I tossed it behind my back. I don't even remember it anymore. And so if you have repented of your sin, confess your sin, but it is constantly coming up in your mind over and over and over again, let me tell you something. God is not talking to you. You are now under attack of the enemy. And the reason why the enemy is bringing up your past is because he has no clue about your future. He doesn't know anything about your future. He may know that there's something special about you, but he don't know what that special is. And so he cannot, con he cannot confront your future, all he can do is continue to bring up your past. But at some point, child of God, you got to look at the enemy and say like the scripture says, if any man be in Christ, he is indeed a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. It is Christ that lives within me. So the enemy uses guilt on us. He tries, listen, there are times when I'm even preaching that the enemy will bring images back up into my mind to try to cause me to fall into a place where I feel unworthy for God to use me. Well, let me just serve notice on the devil so he doesn't waste all his time. I know I'm unworthy for God to use me, but I'm just glad that he does. <laughs> I'm just happy to be a child of God. All you're doing is confirming to me what I already know. That I was dead in trespasses and sins. But God so loved the world. Good God. It. He loved me. Gave himself for me. So you're just confirming what I know. I know I'm unworthy. I'm just grateful to be here. Just thankful to be a servant of God. Just grateful to be a child of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so the enemy doesn't have to remind me of how unworthy I am. I came to that revelation a long time ago. But just because I am unworthy does not mean I am worthless. Ah, hallelujah. It does not mean that I have no value. They say, I've told you all this, but I want to remind some of you all and bring it to some of you all's attention for the first time. That value of an object is not determined by the people who are critical around it. It is determined by the, by the amount that someone who looks at it is willing to pay for it. There are things, have you all ever looked at that, uh, uh, that antique uh, road show thing they do? And, and, and people will pull up stuff that I wouldn't pay five bucks for. But somebody would be willing to pay a million dollars for it. And I'm sitting there thinking, who in the world would look at that thing and say it's worth a million dollars? Well, that person would because he sees it with value that I cannot see. He knows something about it that I do not know. He... Uh, he understands the uniqueness about it that I cannot understand. And so somebody said, well, Brother Jared, how do you know then that I am valuable? Because God gave up everything he had to buy you. The Bible said that we are the purchase of God. In other words, God so loved you that he gave his son for you. And Jesus so loved his father and loved the creation that the father had put in his hand that he was willing to step out of eternity from the glory that he had with the Father and he came down and wrapped himself in mortal flesh and gave himself on the cross. You want to know how I know you're valuable? Because God gave everything for you. God looked at you. I don't care what the neighbors look at you and say. I don't care what your parents look at you and say. I don't care what the school said about you. I don't care what your, come on somebody, what your critics think about you. There's somebody that looked at you and said, you know what? I love that and I'm going to buy it for myself. In fact, when he bought it for you, there was nothing good about it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Good God, you weren't some pristine thing that God looked at and said, you know what? I think I got to have that. But the Bible said that the vessel was marred in the hand of the potter, which means that when he got a hold of me, I was absolute trash. There was nothing good about me. In fact, if people looked at me, they'd say it's unusable. But thank God that God doesn't see as people see. God doesn't see me when I was unusable. But God has called me, good God, because he saw my future and he knows something about me. Look at your neighbor 
tell them that's why I'm still alive. That's why I'm still alive. It wasn't because I was strong. It wasn't because I was smart. It wasn't because I had any money. It was because God loved me and he saw something in The enemy uses fear as a manipulator to try to get us to quit. Uses paranoia. How many of y'all have ever got into the what if conversation? Uh, well, I would, but what if this happens? And what if that happens? And what if I do this? And what if I do that? And what if, and what if, and what if, and what if, and what if? Quit getting in the what if conversation. The what if is ambiguous. It absolutely is infinite. It has no end to it. What if the sky falls? What if I win a million dollars? What if I walk on water? What if I turn back flips? What if I fly through the air like Superman? There are so many things that what if can entail. You don't need to entertain the what if conversation. All you need to go is to the foundation of truth, and that is the word of God. And what if will disappear, and you will look into the word of God and say, you know what? I don't know if I have the ability. I don't even know if I have the talent. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens. He uses terror. The Bible said, be not afraid of sudden fear. Sudden fear is terror. He uses terror in the children of God. But you have to understand that the Bible said that the enemy goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. As is an imagination. In other words, he presents himself to be something. Girls, stop talking. Girls, girls, stop talking. You've been told three times by adults now, stop it. The enemy gets into our spirits, children of God, and he tries to get us to the place where we are terrified. Be not afraid of sudden fear. Fear is the only thing that the enemy can use to manipulate you into a place where you all of a sudden freeze up and don't do anything. Oh, God. Oh, God. What? Oh, God. I don't know if I can do this. Oh, God. What? Is that? Well, 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 are you going to still have that conference, Brother Jared, when, when COVID is breaking out? Yeah, I'd like to see some people healed while we're there. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'd like to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. God in heaven. Are you hearing what I'm saying, saints of God? I still believe that we serve a miracle working God. And I refuse to let the news or anything else terrify me into a place where I become all of a sudden isolated and stationary and completely freeze up and say, oh God, we can't do anything. The devil is a liar. He must understand we've read this book and we went back to the first century. We researched their culture. We researched their diseases. And what we found Found out, saints of God, is if the first century church could thrive in the environment of the 21st century, then so can the 21st century church. There were plagues back then, there was violence back then, there was persecution back then, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do it. Now the news is saying, oh, Afghanistan's been turned over to the Taliban. The next thing is we're going to have a terror attack. It's sure now there's going to be a terror attack. You want to know why? Because they're trying to manipulate you by fear. They found out this fear didn't work. So they're moving on to the next fear and the next terror and the next fear and the next terror and the next fear and the next terror. The next terror. But what they don't understand is we're not afraid to die. We're not afraid to die. In fact, that is the goal line for me. The goal line is when I breathe my last breath because I can't get my trophy until I die. Good God. There can be no resurrection without death. There can be no reward without death. And I can't see Jesus if I don't die. So to me, it's not the end of life. It's the end of death. Because from that point, the next thing I know will be life forevermore. So they come to the wrong place to try to terrify me. Oh, you might die. I sure might. And precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of all of his saints. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, for they rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Oh God, I'm telling you children of God, I'm living to die. I'm living to die. And so the enemy uses fear. Well, you might die. You might die. What I'm trying to help us tonight is to get emotionally mature. There are some of us that are so immature emotionally. 
the least little thing that comes our way just destabilizes us. It is because you refuse to exercise the God-given control that you have over your own thoughts. I can't get in your peanut and put your thoughts under control. You're going to have to get that done for yourself. Come on, somebody. Your great manner doesn't belong to me. I can pray over you. I can speak in tongues. I can spit over you. I can lop so much oil on you that you would slide through a keyhole. But until you get to the place where you make a choice yourself that I refuse from this moment on to ever let the devil have that kind of place in my life. I'm going to let the devil know tonight that I'm not his. I don't belong to him. I've been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to serve an eviction notice on him. Get out of my head, get out of my heart, get out of my home. I can't do that for you. You're going to have to do that for yourself. I can't get control of your thoughts. You're going to have to do that for yourself. Well, my God, Brother Jared, it's every other minute. Didn't get control of it every other minute. That's the only way you build any strength in God or stamina in God is, listen, at some point, those days will go. And you will find yourself with further links between battles. Right now, the reason why you're having to have a fight with your mind every five minutes is because you're not emotionally or mentally mature at this point. It takes time, child of God. Don't think there's something wrong with you. We all have been there, praise God. The only reason why we're a little further is because we decided one day that we were tired of the enemy kicking us around. We were tired of the enemy messing with our homes. And we decided, you know what? I'm not going to deal with this anymore. I have God on my side. And if God be for me, who can? can be against me. <laughs> Joshua said it this way. He said, if the gods that your father served on the other side of the blood, their God served them. Last time I checked, Baal couldn't bring fire down out of heaven. Come on, somebody. Doesn't matter how many children they offered to Moloch, he couldn't cause it to rain. Didn't matter what they did. Those gods had no power over them because those gods were Satan worship. Buddha is Satan worship. Islam is Satan worship. Anything that is anti-Christ is of the devil. Come on, somebody. Secular humanism is devil worship. Psychological humanism is devil worship. You say, what is that? People who are always worried about their feelings. Well, how do you feel about that? At some point, I just look at people and say, it doesn't matter how I feel. The truth is, there's where the difference is. Some of us, well, how do you feel? I Listen, there are some people, they come up to me. Man, praise the Lord, Master. How you doing? I'm doing well. How you doing? Oh, no, I didn't ask them. Oh, God, they're going to tell me. They're going to tell me. So now I say, praise the Lord, I'm doing well. Thank you. God bless. Because there are some people that they think what identifies them is their emotionalism. That's what makes them special is how they feel. No, we all feel. It's just some of us exist in truth. Others of us like to live in our fields. Look at somebody near you and tell them, get up out your fields. Get up out your fields. Doesn't matter how you feel. At some point, you're going to have to live in the truth. Because your feelings are a lie. Your feelings... How can you say my feelings are a lie? Because I am going to be 40 years old in a month. And now I feel totally different about things than I did when I was 25. So either the feelings then were true or the feelings now are true. That's the reason why you can't operate in emotionalism. It's too volatile. You have to just operate in the word. Doesn't matter how. There's sometimes I wake up in my fields. You know what I do? I take my size 13 foot and I kick my own self in the butt and say, get over yourself. It doesn't matter how you feel. God said. Your feelings don't make you special. Everybody has them. Oh, I just burst somebody's bubble. I just messed with somebody. Well, go pray about it. 
We all have emotions. God created us with them. We all feel things. And sometimes all of us feel things very deeply. But we have to govern our emotions by truth. And Jesus said, sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. And so the enemy is always using your emotions against you. Feelings against you. He'll make you angry at nothing. He'll make you depressed over absolutely nothing. He will make you anxious over nothing. He will, he will call. Have you ever sat and just all of a sudden got mad and don't even know why you're mad? Because the enemy's playing with your emotions. He's putting things in your heart. And that's the reason why you have to guard that thing. Keep it. Guard it. Put a wall around it. Against the devil. Tell the devil. I, 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 I. Every time I feel this way, I'm going to go to the word of God and see if I have a right to. Uh, I'm just an angry person. No, that's not what you are at all. You just refuse to get control of your anger. Most of what we diagnose is just absolute unwillingness to self-discipline. I can't control myself. Bipolar can't help it. The devil is a liar. Stop accepting diagnosis from carnal men over what God has said about you. I can't help, I'm just bipolar. I can't help it. I get angry for no reason. That's called self-discipline. We all at times get angry over nothing. You know what we do? We go to the word of God and say, get yourself under control. Ah, uh, praise God. But the enemy will put that in your spirit. The enemy's always trying to put things in your heart, and you have to understand that. And the Bible said it is when men slept that the enemy came in and sowed tears amongst them. It is when they slept. It is at the time where you are not paying attention. Where you're not watching carefully, that the enemy will come in and start sowing things into your spirit. And all of a sudden, your whole attitude has changed. Y'all need, some of y'all need an attitude adjustment. I need a total attitude adjustment. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. I was in a meeting one time, and this brother was up talking, and he was so angry. I mean, just had a horrible countenance on his face. And, uh, he looked back at a brother of mine that I, I love, good friend of mine, and he said, what do you think? He goes, well, I think you can look a little happier. <laughs> and that brother looked back at him to prove that he was wrong and said, you don't know me, I am happy. <laughs> Whoa, yeah, you look so happy. <laughs> I don't want you happy. You keep your happy to yourself. I am happy. We all need an attitude adjustment every once in a while. We need to get our joy back. David said this. David was in a very difficult time in his life. And he said, he said, Lord, return unto me the joy of thy salvation. Because it is the joy of the Lord that is your strength. If you lose your joy, you've lost your strength. And sometimes you've got to fight for your joy. And so what do you do? When the enemy comes at you like that, when he starts messing with your mind, when psychological warfare begins to take place. Now, you go take your medication, whatever, but I'm going to tell you something. I've been preaching this gospel a long time, and I've dealt with a lot of people who are under psychological attack as well. And the medication did nothing for them but deaden them. It numbed them to the place where even God had a difficult time putting them down. That's what it did for them. I had one lady, and let me tell you something, spirits can be attached to this stuff. You gotta be careful. Demonic powers can be attached to this stuff. I had one lady came into our church and she got completely delivered of, 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 of depression. And she was, they called clinically depressed. God delivered her for several weeks, man, just joyful and happy. She calls somebody who was of the medical profession and says, I got to tell you what happened to me at church. She was so happy. She said, I have been delivered. I have not had joy like this in my life ever. 
And the person said, you don't listen to him. He's not a doctor. You get back on your medication. You need that. The woman called me back in an hour with a masculine, demonic voice. Let me tell you something. I need this medication. I, I, I am on fire right now. I said, well, did you take it? Yeah. Then why are you on fire? I thought that was the fix. What's wrong with you now? So, uh, uh, demons are attached to this stuff. Saints, you better be careful what you're playing with. You're gonna, once you start playing with the head, you start opening the door for a whole lot of demonic activity. Come on, somebody. Because that's your heart. Your heart is not this blood pumper. Your heart is this right here in your head. And if you don't keep it, the enemy's going to come and take it. So you say, Pastor, I deal with fear. What do, you, what do, what do I do when, when the enemy's in my head telling me that I need to be afraid? You just look at him plainly and say, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. Oh, you need to be afraid because this could happen to you and that could happen to you and that could. I don't think so. The enemy will always demean you. God will never, ever diminish you. God will correct you, but he will never tear you down to the place that you are unusable. Because the reason why he saved you and brought you unto himself, filled you with the Holy Ghost, brought you to the church of Jesus Christ, is because he has purpose over your life. And so when the enemy starts telling you, there's nothing good about you, you're worthless, you'll never be anything. You Stop listening to that junk. Tell the devil, I don't think so. I am a child of the living God. I am a king's kid. I am called of God and precious. The Lord gave himself for me. I don't think so. When the enemy comes to tell you and says, you know what? Oh, you're going to die. This could happen to you and that could happen to you and that could happen to you. And people could do this to you and people could do that to you. You need to look at him and say, I don't think so. But no weapon that is formed against me shall be able to prosper. And every tongue that rises against me in judgment, God will condemn that what if they persecute you well guess what blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely but my name's sake for great is your reward in heaven oh so when the enemy says god don't love you people are persecuting you you just look at him and say i don't think so i don't think so for many are the afflictions of the righteous but the lord delivereth them out of them all oh god i what I'm saying, saints of God, when the enemy tells you, you'll never ever get out of depression. You just look at him and say, I don't think so. You'll never ever be delivered of anxiety. I don't think so. You'll never ever be delivered of manic depression. I don't think so. You're always going to be a bipolar. I don't think so. Why? Because he will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on the Lord. Oh, somebody just tell the devil, I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm not going to stop praising God. I don't think so. I'm not going to stop worshiping. I don't think so. I'm not going to stop being faithful to church. I don't think so. Why? Because I, like David, have lifted mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord. Oh, devil, let me tell you tonight. I don't think so. You came at the wrong time to the wrong person. And now I'm in the right place. I don't think so. I'm not going to die here. But I'm going to live and declare the works of the Lord. I Look at your neighbor and tell him, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. The devil's trying to tell you God don't love you. I don't think so. The devil's trying to tell you, well, you know what you did. God can't forgive you. I don't think so. But he said he would cleanse me from all unrighteousness and he would forgive me of my sin. So I don't care what you try to tell me. I'm not going backwards. I'm not running the towel. I'm not quitting. I'm not walking away. I'm going to keep serving God. Because devil, you know there's something about me that's going to mess your whole world up and you're trying to stop me before I get there. So before you put your hands on me again, let me remind you that I am blood washed. I am fire baptized. I am filled with the Holy Ghost. Let me remind you that unless God lets you, you are off limits. And if God lets you attack me, we know that all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord and are they called It's that simple. I'm going to get control.
control over my mind. I'm going to get control over my emotions. I'm going to stop letting the devil wreak havoc over me. I'm turning that junk off. I'm not listening to that type of music. I'm going to fill my head with the word of God because David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin again.
Come on, somebody. The enemy is that dragon, that fallen angel, Lucifer and Satan. Come on, somebody. You'll see people illegally coming up from the border. And every person you see of Hispanic descent, you're going to look at them with eyes of, I wonder if you're here legally. They don't belong in our hearts. They don't belong in our spirits. That's a division. That is to create confusion. So you know what I do? I go to the Bible. Let me show you how this works. If the enemy tries to sow anything into my spirit against anyone of any ethnicity, you know what I do? I don't sit there and go research what they did. I go to the throne. I look into the sea of glass when Jesus comes back and catches away the church. You know what I see there? <laughs> it sounds crazy. I see people of all nations, all kindreds, all tribes, all tongues. I don't know who this is for, but you better get over this mess or it's going to destroy your spirit. It's going to cause you to hate. And let me tell you something. The Bible said he that hates his brother is a murderer. And we know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. If the devil can get you to hate people because of their skin color, he has caused you to be a murderer. And it is going to cost you eternal life. I gotta find out why that happened. Why that? You don't need to know why that happened. Let me tell you why that happened. Because God said to Noah, from their youth, men have their imaginations have been continually evil. I just I just expressed to you why racism, prejudice, oppression exists in the world. Because from their youth, their imaginations are continually upon evil. You don't need to go any further than that. Because you know what happened? Look what they did. 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 Look, that person looks like them. Let me go deal with them because look what they did. Come on, somebody. That's how it starts. And all of a sudden, there's anger and hatred in your heart towards somebody. You are now a murderer. And no murderer has eternal life abiding in them. So when the enemy comes to tell me, you'll never ever get black people and white people and Hispanic people, Haitian people, African people, you'll never get them together. I'm going to invite him to Thursday night service. Because <laughs> they're all going to be in the house. <laughs> I'm telling you, saints of God, all I got to do is tell him, I don't think so. Because I've looked into the sea of glass. And when I go up there before the throne of God, guess what? There's going to be people from every every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, and we're all going to stand before the same creator, and we are going to cry hallelujah, we are going to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb, we are going to cast our, come on somebody, they're all going to be there, Jew and Gentile, bond and free, come on somebody, Greek and barbarian, everybody's going to be there, who's been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and what I love about you, is he may have been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but he came for all of us. Because he said, whosoever will, let him come and drink freely. Oh, God, God's got something for saints. It's just we're going to have to get our minds under control. And how do you do it, Pastor? Listen, if you think that you're constantly under attack. What do you think he's doing to me? If I if I am the leadership of this church, if I am the bishop of this house, what do you think he's doing to me? He's constantly after me. He's relentless. 
But I saw Jesus just keep taking him back to the world until he left. And that's what I do. I just keep taking him back to the world until he leaves. I don't think so, devil. I don't think so. Somebody said, Pastor, you act like you ain't got no problems in the world. You come in here and you worship like you ain't got no problems. Some of that stuff is an I don't think so prayer. I just come to prove the devil wrong. Come on, somebody. Don't you know that that was one of the purposes that God permitted Job to come under attack? Was to prove to the devil that not everybody will curse God when they come under trial. There will be some people that will bless God and curse him God. Come on, somebody. In fact, Job's wife was full of the devil. You say, how do you know she was full of the devil? Because she was trying to get Job to do the very thing that the devil told God he would. Why don't you just curse God and die? Woman, you speak foolishly. Right. The Lord gives. Right. The Lord takes away. Right. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He said, by the way, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Right. Why? Why, Job? Why? Because he said, if a man dies, where is he? He said, where is he? He said, oh, that thou would hide me in the grave. Yeah, right. That thou would keep me secret until your indignation or to your wrath. Yeah, right. He said, if a man dies, mm -hmm. shall he live again? He said, all the days <laughs> of my appointed time will I wait yeah, right. till my change come. Yeah. He said, for thou wilt call and I will answer thee. Yeah, yeah. For thou wilt have a desire yeah. to the works of thy hands. Good. He said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And in the latter day, he will stand upon the earth. He said, I will see him for myself and not another. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm telling you, saints of God, we have every reason to look at the devil and tell him, I don't think so. Because for us, there's hope in life. There's hope in death. And there's hope in eternity. You can't destroy people who live in hope. You want to be a prisoner of something? Be a prisoner of hope. Let hope hold on to you. Let hope get a hold of you. And don't you ever, don't you ever give it a reason to let go. Live in hope. Serve in hope. Worship in hope. But, but, Pastor, I'm really under the attack of the enemy right now. And before you leave this house tonight, you give the devil, I, you give the Lord an I don't think so praise. And you tell the devil, you're not taking my praise away from me. I'm, I'm going to praise him anyway. I'm going to praise him anyway. I'm going to praise him anyway. Well, you don't, uh, what if I don't feel like praising him? Praise him anyway. Because the enemy is trying to tell you, you can't praise God. You can't praise God. Look at your spirit. Look at your attitude. You know how to break out your attitude? Now to break out your spirit, praise him. I'm telling you, you start praising God, your spirit will change. Your mind will change. Your heart will change. So if the enemy brought you in here tonight and told you, you can't praise God in your condition, I, I wish that somebody in here would give the Lord an I don't think so praise. Tell the devil, I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm going to praise him anyhow. I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. And his praise will continually be in my mouth. You can't praise God. I don't think so. Shut your mouth. I don't think so. Don't you say a word. I don't think so. Don't you. Don't you. Don't, I don't think so. Praise him. Praise him. Bless his wonderful name. Don't you say anything. Well, if all I can get out is Jesus, then say Jesus. I the good God in will not die. I don't think so. I will live and declare the works of the Lord. Woo. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Look at your neighbor. Tell him, tell the enemy, I don't think so. I don't think so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
You don't need to be going to church. <laughs> Listen, I don't think so. The Bible said, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together, even as the manner of some is, even the more so as you see the day approaching. I don't think so. Stay at home. I don't think so. Come on, don't call them. They can't help you. I don't think so, Satan. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because the Bible said, prepare ye one another's burdens and pray ye one for another and you will be healed. So I don't think so. You're not going to cause me to disconnect from the body. You're not going to cause me to disconnect from the Lord. I'm going to stay and I'm going to grow where I've been planted. I don't, I don't think so. The Lord, God. Let me tell you something. You got people call you. You got people contact you. You know, you can't, you know, ain't got nothing to do with that. You know, come on, come on. You know, come on. Hey, man, you remember, you remember back in the day? Let's just go have some fun like we used to. Let's just go to, look, man, come on, what? Church? Oh, come on. Are you kidding me? You, church? You, church? Come on now. I remember back. Oh, okay. You done forgot where you come from. You forgot who you were. Oh, so back in the day, you just ain't looking at him and say, I ain't into back in the day. Look, some of us have gray hair. I didn't have gray hair back in the day. What does that mean? That means that I have lived a while since back in the day. Oh, now you got holy roller. Oh, now you're so spiritual. Oh, praise God. Yes, I am. Oh, thank God I'm growing. I'm maturing. I may not be where I want to be, but thank God I ain't where I used to be. Oh, praise God. I'm going from faith to faith and from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. I know you meant that as an insult, but thank you for confirming to me that I'm actually growing and crying. Let's go to the club. I don't think so. Let's go drink a little. I don't think so. Come on, I got some pills. I don't think so. Come on, a little weed won't hurt you. I don't think so. I found the most high, and there ain't no high like the most high. Come on, somebody. Come on. Let's go to the party. I've been to a party. I went down the house of God on Wednesday night to a Holy Ghost party, and there ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. but I feel the Holy Ghost in here. I feel like somebody got a revelation in here tonight. Look at your neighbor and tell them, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. The devil's been on me to try to get me to leave, to try to get me to surrender, but I am free. I'm a child of God. Come on, the chains have been broken. The yoke is destroyed. The prison doors have been opened. I am now free. something. There ain't going to be no white, black, Arab community in the kingdom of God. Because I'm going to give up this vile body, and he's going to give me a body like it under his glorious body. Well, what does that look like? John said, I turned and saw one. His hair was white like wool, and his eyes the flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. Good. I got to, I got to be amongst my people. Good people. What people are you talking about? I got, to, I got to be amongst my people. I don't even know who you're talking about. Well, I got to know. I got to know my people. I don't know my people. I am a mutt. I come from so different, so many different nationalities that if my family tree, saints of God, is all over the world. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It stretches to Poland. Come on, to, to Ireland. It stretches everywhere. It stretches to some nation, Indian nation in the United States. I don't know who I am. Not in the world I don't, but I do know that I am a child of the living God. Ah, hallelujah. And I don't care where you come from. We are all in the same. 
same blood, born of the same spirit. God is our father. New Jerusalem is our mother. Somebody say, you ever done a family tree, Brother Jared? I sure have. The word of God, it reaches right to heaven. And its branches are all over this congregation tonight. Come on, somebody. Come on. I know you don't think that me and Brother Calvin are brothers because he's black and I'm white, but you just don't see it. You can't see the resemblance? You can't see it? Are you kidding me right now? Are you out of your mind? Saints of God, Jesus looks good on all of us. Come on. He looks like Jesus. I look like Jesus. You look like Jesus. Look at somebody. Tell them I'm glad that Jesus looks good on you. Oh, hallelujah. We look just alike. What do you mean we're not brothers? We look just alike. After a spirit tonight, there's a spirit came up in this church tonight. I guarantee you, it wish it hadn't now. I'm after a spirit tonight. We're gonna love one another with a love unfeigned. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The Bible said in the spirit there is neither male nor female, there's neither Jew nor barbarian, or Jew nor Gentile, Greek nor barbarian. We are all one in Jesus Christ. You want to look at your family tree? Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. You know who your great grandfather is? No. You know who your great great grandfather is? No. They have these family reunions back in Illinois where I come from. And they sit down and they talk about all our family history. You care? No. Why? Because they did. Every one of them. Last time I checked, every one of them in that book are dead. They can't talk to me. They can't counsel with me. But I can come into the church of Jesus Christ. And we all alive in here. I got the word of God in our... I come straight from Queen Elizabeth. And you ain't got no crown. Congratulations. You found out that you were one of the bastard children they sent to the United States. Glory to God. Oh, that was tight, but it was right. Why did you in Buckingham? Come on, where's your mom and daddy at? Who was the Duke of what? That stuff made no difference to me. I don't care nothing about it. Because when we get people to the church, their genealogy changes. Come on, listen. You might dig far enough to realize you got a serial killer as a grandfather. So you're going to identify with that? You might go back to a grandmother that played a harp. You're going to identify with that? Well, my grandmother would have heard so. No. They're all dead now. The only thing that I care about is that Jesus died, but he rose again. And he is now seated at the right hand making intercession for me. Come on, somebody. I don't care nothing about that stuff. I have found the family of God. I know who my father is. Come on. I thank God for my biological father. Thank God he's in church serving God. But let me tell you something. My father, which art in heaven, is the same as his father, who is in heaven. We all can whether you like it or not. Amen. We're all children of God. And I am not, listen, I'm not going to let that stuff get into my spirit. Because it won't be long. All that stuff will stir up again. Where people have done evil things. Okay. I'm just going to help you out. Go find a group of people of any ethnicity that does not have absolute evil in their history. Go find them. You know, them white people, they enslaved black people, they did, and it was evil. But you know who was selling them to us? <laughs> tribes in Africa were conquering other tribes, bringing them down to the shoreline and selling them on the slave block. Everybody's done evil, saints. People of my complexion have done evil. People of your complexion have done evil. I'm not getting into all that mess. I found Jesus. And I found the body of Christ. And you know what? There's goodness here. There's mercy here. There's love here. There's kindness here. No matter where you come from, 
I know that some of y'all may think, oh man, you people look real good. You, you guys, no, people don't understand. You don't understand. How many extra guys we got in this church? Right? Alcoholics? Come on, somebody. How many people come from abuse? We've got people in this church that have hung on stripper poles. We got people in this church that have played prostitutes. You know why we look like we look now? It's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. He's changed our life. And I'm not going back, saints of God. So next time the enemy comes to you knocking at that door, just tell him I don't think so. You've had long enough of my life. And I am not. I am absolutely not. Gonna go down that aisle ever again. Amen. Because we're growing together, enjoying the truth, getting used to the family. I'll spend eternity with learning to love you. How easy it is getting used to the family of God. Because we're growing together. We're enjoying the truth. We're getting used to the family. We'll spend eternity with learning to love you. How easy it is. I'm getting used to the family of God. Because we're growing together, enjoying the truth, getting used to the family. I'll spend eternity with. I'm learning to love you. How easy it is. I'm getting used to the family. Of God, one more time, because we're growing together, enjoying the truth. I'm getting used to the family. I'll spend eternity with. I'm learning to love you. How easy it is. I'm getting used to the family of God. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're just going to push that devil right out the house. Amen. Amen. And we're getting ready to have a conference, saints, <clears throat> where people are coming in from all over the world, all around the country, saints of God whom we love, saints of God whom we We'll meet for the first time. And it's going to be an awesome time. And everybody's not going to look like you. And everybody's not going to talk like you. Amen. I, I've had Brother Ratibi, who is a very close friend of mine from Nairobi, Kenya. He's going to be here with his wife. Brother Ratibi is one of the most plain spoken people I've ever met in my life. And I have had people say, you know what? It's just hard to understand. I'm like, you are just full of it. You're so full of it. It's because he speaks with a different dialect you can't understand. Listen, if you can understand people in East Tennessee, you can understand people from the Indian. Amen. Because we have Southern dialect around here, but we have so many of them Southern dialects. Like, everybody has their own dialect. Amen. Greenville has its own dialect. Rarville has its own dialect. Kingsport has its own dialect, and I'm not sure where in the world Johnson City is. <laughs> Bristol and Bluntville, they got their own dialect. Churchill got their own dialect. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> we're going to kick that devil right out of here. That's what I'm going to put up with. Amen. We're going to have love for one another. Amen. All right, we're going to take up our tithes and our offerings. Woo! Amen. I did not mean to preach this long tonight. But good is the will of the Lord. Amen. 
I just thank God that we're able to grow together and enjoy one another, enjoy each other's presence, love one another with a pure heart fervently and a love unfeigned. Amen. And if God has touched your heart tonight, man, just tell the devil where to go. Sometimes you just got to tell the devil to go to hell. Just get out of my life. Amen. That's where you belong. That's where you're headed. So let me just go ahead and give you your destination. Your final destination is the lake of fire, Satan. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to go on and live with Jesus. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> I'm not going to hell. Where's Sister Ashley at? Praise God. I ain't going to hell. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for this night. Thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. Thank you for the word of God that has been spread in our hearts. Lord God, the table of, of, of the word that has been spread, God, and it's been sown into our spirits. We thank you so much for it, God. Help us to just get an I don't think so in our hearts when it comes to the enemy of our souls. He come but to kill, steal, and destroy, Lord. Let us remind ourselves, continue that the enemy is not our friend or our bedfellow. He's not got good plans for us. He wants nothing but our destruction. So help us to just look at him continually. I continue. I don't care if it's every two minutes, every five minutes, every ten minutes. I don't think so, devil. I have been I have been born again. I'm a child of God. The Lord delivered me out of your hand. I'm not going back to it. Now, Lord, I pray, God, for this offering that you would bless those that have to give. Bless them abundantly. As you watch over your word to perform it concerning them in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, stand to your feet. Let's for the Lord. week starting Thursday night we'll be at the hosting the call to war over at Preaching Christ Church and Pastor Chad and them have been uh, just kind enough to let us use their facility uh, and it will start Thursday night at 7 o'clock looking forward to hearing the preaching of the, of the word of God worshiping with saints from all over the place uh, all different types of cultures and backgrounds and uh, it's going to be an awesome time of the Lord I encourage you not to sit isolated off to yourself I don't want a new destiny section at the, at the conference. Amen. Praise God. Go mingle with people. Meet your brothers and sisters. Uh, amen. Show the love of God to them. Um, and then, of course, we will have Friday morning service at 10 o'clock. Uh, I'm sorry, at 11 o'clock. I apologize. Friday is at 11 o'clock uh, till 3. Then we'll have dinner. And then we'll come back Friday night at 7, Saturday morning at 11, 
Saturday night at 7, and then Sunday we will be back here at 11 o'clock at the church here. Uh, it's just going to be a great weekend. It's going to be a lot of stuff. Amen. Eat your Wheaties. Because <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be a great week, though. Um, we will not have a regular service here Wednesday night, but we will have prayer meeting. So I want to encourage all of you saints to come and let's pray for the conference. Uh, let's just pray that God's glory and his power will be shown among us. I'm looking forward to that very much. So um, I want to pray for all those uh, who are, are sick. I've been dealing with allergies, but I'm telling you, man, you 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 have a you have a runny nose, and people look at you like you've got a third eyeball. I need to wear a pen that says, "Chill out, it's allergies." <laughs> got no fever, got no symptoms, it's just allergies. But let's pray. Uh, Mayfield, uh, the church in Mayfield, they're struggling uh, with this virus. Uh, Brother Deloy Smith, his son Jay, is in the hospital in very serious condition, so we want to pray for him. And I know there have been many requests, uh, so we, you know, we don't make light of this uh, disease. We don't make light of this virus. We know it's real. All of us, I think, probably in here have been sick with it. Uh, so we understand that it's real, but we just are not going to be afraid of it. We're not going to live in terror. We are going to serve God, amen. live for God. Yes. And, uh, and, and be careful. Take precautions. Amen. Don't walk around without a shower for a week. Amen. Don't, don't not wash your hands after you go to the restroom. Be, let's have good hygiene and be careful. Amen. Don't cough in people's faces. There's all kinds of good things we can exercise to be careful and cautious. But at the same time, I'm not going to live in terror. I'm not going to be afraid of sudden fear. We're going to live for the Lord. Um, let's pray for Gavin. He needs our prayers. Kim needs our prayers. Uh, in fact, we're going to pray over a prayer cloth here in just a moment for Gavin. Uh, so let's let's be in prayer for him. And Chris? My mom is having surgery tonight. Your mom is having surgery.
and she's now leading worship in the house of God. So God can do it. Amen. So let's pray. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercy. We thank you for the word of God that heals us, God, for you said you sent forth your word to heal our disease. So, Father, we speak to the cancer right now, God, and we declare the word of God over it that by the stripes that were on Jesus Christ, this dear sister is healed in the name of Jesus. I curse cancer in the name of Jesus. I command it now to die in her body. Lord, that when she goes to the doctor, Lord God, the doctor will have a testimony of the report of the Lord that she was miraculously healed by the power of God. Lord, you said that you confirmed your word with signs following. And so, Lord, we don't believe you are a respecter of times, generations, or persons, God. But, Lord, if you did it for them, you'll do it for us. So, Lord, we now give you praise, glory, and honor in the name of Jesus for doing this according to your word. Now, oh God, get the glory out of this and we will give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. strengthen him as well as Ken and the household. God would keep and all of us safe and all of us watch over keep sickness from our doorstep. Amen. The enemy can do nothing to hinder us in this upcoming conference. So God, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray over my nephew right now, God. Lord, I believe in the name of Jesus that as you did for the servant of the centurion, God, you can send forth your word right now into that house, oh God, and heal him in the name of Jesus. Lord God, right now, show yourself strong unto him, God. Open up those airways, God. Help him to breathe normally, oh God. Help him to breathe, God, without struggle, oh God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I don't care what the doctor's report says. I don't care that they say that this will be common for him. Lord, I know what your word says, and I'm going to take you at your word. Lord, heal him by your stripes. Send forth your word even now that at this very hour, God, he will be healed and made whole in the name of Jesus. And Lord, even as you did for the apostles, they took portions of the skirts of the garments of the apostles. They anointed them and sent them to the sick, and the sick were healed. Again, no, no respecter of times, persons, or generations. If you did it for them, you'll do it for us. So Lord, we give you praise in advance for what you're going to do in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And God, I pray over your people, God, that you would touch them even now. Keep them safe, God. Watch over them, God. Lord, bless them and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them. Be gracious unto them. Lift your countenance upon them. Grant them peace in the mighty name of Jesus. Let them leave here and go home and tell the devil, I don't think so. It's over in my home. It's over in my heart. It's over in my mind. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to choose today that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, oh God, go with them. Keep them. Watch over them, God. Use them for your glory. And we will give you praise, glory, and honor for it all. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Go with God, saints. God bless you. We will see you guys Sunday. But before we leave, Jeremiah turned 11 years old today. Come on, Jeremiah. All right. Y'all ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Jeremiah. Happy birthday to you. Oh, happy birthday to you. Oh, happy birthday to you. May you find Jesus dear every day of the year. Oh, happy birthday to you. Oh, happy birthday to you. And the best one you've ever had. God bless you guys. Go with God. Have a great rest of this week. We'll see you Sunday.
say brother and sister around here. You know why? It's because we're a family and these folks are so dear. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family. 